The city is our best invention, and it is our worst disaster. Our cities are degrading the environment around them. We have to uh, make our cities absolutely sustainable. We have to use less of the land more intensively. Cities everywhere are under pressure to support their growing populations and meet their future energy and transportation needs in far more sustainable ways. We know that in the next about 26 years, a million more people will move to the Metro Vancouver area. And if we don't do anything on the transportation side of things, about 500,000 more cars. No longer can we say, well, let's build endless suburbs out where you supposedly escape. Instead, we have to build cities that people want to be in. Success depends on how well cities utilize their underground, because what happens below greatly enhances what is possible above. We have to take many of the things that over the 20th century we just plopped around the surface of our cities and move them underground. The movement to put more underground is underway. Garbage trucks are disappearing from a downtown as trash moves through underground tubes to collection stations. Cargo trucks no longer choke a downtown with the opening of a new road tunnel that diverts port traffic away from city streets. A new water supply tunnel crosses a river to deliver water to millions more customers. The world's largest hydro tunnel taps the power of a natural wonder to provide clean, renewable energy to millions for decades to come. And a vast underground shopping complex connects 30 kilometers of underground shopping and services to mass transit. You can walk for miles in Toronto with, without ever having to surface. That is important in a city with inclement weather. And let's face it, January and February, you want to be underground in Toronto. Very few cities have regretted putting infrastructure underground, not just metro, but any infrastructure underground. World-class cities recognize that moving people efficiently is critical to their long-term economic success. London and Paris invested early on in their underground transit systems. They then recaptured a lot of the surface space for the kind of amenities that people want. So we think of both cities now as incredibly livable cities. And both cities are economic powerhouses. Yes, it is expensive to go underground, but Look at the value of the land that you free up. Look at the benefit to day-to-day -to -day activity. Vancouver was one of the first cities to tap into land values to help pay for public amenities by allowing developers to build above density limits. The model is being used to help expand rapid transit in the region. And they share in the profit that the developer is going to gain by being able to increase its density. And the increased revenue had to be shared with the municipality so they could put an additional station into the rapid transit system. Cities are also considering new approaches to optimize budgets and planning of underground infrastructure. If you're a city and you're building two kilometers per year, well after 20 years you have 40K. Why does someone have to come in and say we want to build 20K in three years? Compressing it drives up the costs. You don't have the people, the skills, but if someone has continuity of two kilometers per year, businesses can be built around this market, which brings the cost down. Inspiring the public is also key. The attitude that people won't pay taxes is based on a simple thing. It's that no one has inspired them to want to pay taxes by showing them that the city could be so much more livable and so much more sustainable. The city also benefits from rising property values. A bus system doesn't cause property values to go up very much, but rapid transit, because any investor knows it's there for good, and any consumer knows it's there for good, more valuable development sites uh, become available and can be built near stations. Cities are also learning from past mistakes. Toronto's elevated expressway opened in the late 50s, dissecting the city. Today, the expressway is costing the city $12 million a year in maintenance alone and is coming to the end of its useful life. Of course, the underground structure would be a little costlier, but 
all in all, undergrounding for uh, a downtown community makes the ultimate sense. You know, one of the first things that goes as you continue to expand the surface for cars is all of your landscape, leaving you with an austere, quite brutal uh, urban place. To reclaim the surface, cities are putting more infrastructure underground, a double-deck road tunnel to replace an elevated expressway and reclaim a waterfront a high-rise building with foundations that double as automated parking for extremely efficient use of space, with similar separate parking for bicycles nearby. A more direct sea link connecting two major commercial centers, and a world-class transit system for a city in the rapidly developing Middle East. The demand and the possibilities are endless. We need not only one relief subway in downtown Toronto, we need two more, and I believe that if we get buy-in from the provincial government and the feds, we can have that. Underground infrastructure has longer lifespans and requires less maintenance. Disruptions to commercial and daily life is limited during construction, and advancements in technology are making the once impossible possible. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, when a good Canadian group of people wanted to build the Jubilee Line to Canary Wharf, well, the British were saying, can't, you can't tunnel on the south side of the Thames. At the end of the day, we did tunnel on the south side of the Thames, and the Jubilee Line was built, and Canary Wharf has been built, and the real estate development has occurred in, in Canary Wharf. The technology is there that we can tunnel in almost any type of ground and not affect um, businesses, streets, or even the public on the surface. The underground is no longer the realm of utilities and major infrastructure, but it's for museums where priceless collections are safe from harmful sunlight, for wastewater treatment plants that can power homes above, for factories and storage facilities where temperatures are constant and vibrations limited. And even earth scrapers are under consideration with central voids that allow natural sunlight to reach the lowest levels. The possibilities are exciting. We don't promote our successes enough. The work that we do is fantastic. Set the challenge and we engineers will respond. Because what happens underground greatly enhances and expands what is possible above.